are jumping back into Virgil's Aeneid, and uh, we are in book three. We did read the first stop that Aeneas and his people have made as they sail away from Troy, Troy that has sadly, sadly fallen. So next we're going to hear some other, some other stops along the way. Some good, some, some not so good. Uh, and again... If I had the time, I would have gone through and like marked which specific passages I was going to read. Who has the time for that? But I'm going to skip a little bit ahead and get to... So they stop at an island devoted to Apollo. Oh, Apollo. Find this here. Blah, blah, blah. They set off again. They're blown off course. We were blown off course and veered in darkness over the waves. My pilot, Palinurus himself, could barely tell day from night, he said, and sighting nothing but sea about us could not keep direction. Three days on the deep sea muffled in fog. Three starless nights we wandered blind. At dawn on the fourth day we raised land far away in clearing weather, hilltops, and then smoke, a spiral in calm air. Our sails came down, we took to the oars. No dallying. The seamen heaved up whirls of foam on the dark blue sea, pulling across it. Uh, one interesting note here, we have the dark blue sea, and famously, Homer talks about the wine dark sea. So like a dark, so dark it's purple. Um, they find some land, they try to hide. Oh, oh, this is good. Okay. Found it. When we pulled into port, what met our eyes but sleek herds in the meadows everywhere, and flocks of goats, no one attending them. Setting upon them with our swords, we sent up shouts to the gods, to Jove himself, to share the windfall with us. Then, on the curving beach, we set out couches for a savory feast. But instantly, grotesquely whirring down, the harpies were upon us from the hills with deafening beats of wings. They trounced our meat, defiling everything they touched with filth and gave an obscene squawk amid the stench. We tried again. In a secluded gorge under a cliffside, in thick shade of trees, we set our tables up, relit our altars, but the loud horde again from another quarter came out of hiding, swooped down on the prey with hooked feet, hunched to feed, and spoiled our feast. I then gave orders to resort to arms and make war on the vicious flock. My men did as commanded, laid their swords nearby, hidden in grass, and kept shields out of sight. Now when the birds flew down along the cove once more with their infernal din, Missinus from a high lookout sounded the alarm on his brass horn. Into their midst, my men attacked and tried a strange new form of battle to cut the indecent seabirds down in blood. But they received no impact on their feathers, took on their backs no wounding cut. Too quick, they soared away into the upper air, leaving the prey half-eaten and befouled. Only Kaleno, perched on a high crag, a ghastly witch, brought out words, croaking down, So war is all you give in recompense for slaughter of bulls and bullocks? Can it be heirs of Laomedon? You'd arm for war to drive the innocent harpies from their country? Then put your mind on what I prophesy, a thing foretold to Phoebus by the Almighty Father, and by Apollo then to me. Now I, first of the Furies, will disclose it to you. Italy is the land you look for. Well, the winds will blow. You'll find your Italy. You'll be allowed to enter port, but you may never wall your destined city till deathly famine, for the bloodshed here has made you grind your tables with your teeth. On this, she took wing back into the forest, but our men of a sudden felt their blood run cold and lost all heart. Not with arms now, but prayers and vows, they begged me to make peace, whether these foes were goddesses or birds, obscene and dire, my father, facing seaward, hands held out, invoked the heavenly powers, and pledged the rituals due them. 
Gods, he said, turn back this thing for t foreboded. Gods, avert disaster of that kind. Cherish your faithful. Hawsers were cast off at his word, and sheets paid out to tugging canvas as the south wind filled the sails. Over the white-capped waves we fled while wind and pilot called our course. And soon, out of the sea, we raised Zacynthus' leafy bulk. Uh, basically, they get to another island. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they get to a place seemingly good. And yep, wouldn't you know it, the goddamn harpies are there messing up their food. It happens to the best of people. So this one, this harpy misadventure, is a reference not to the Odyssey, uh, if you remember, but to the um, the Argonautica, right? So it was Jason and the Argonauts who encountered the Harpies and saved an innocent man from getting all of his food eaten, who then told Jason where he need to, needed to go, so gave him a little bit of prophecy. Here we have an actual Harpy telling uh, Aeneas where he's going to end up. And that fateful line, you're not going to make it until you're so hungry you eat your tables. Foreshadowing? A hint of something to come? Maybe. Maybe. Let's read on. Uh, they get to another island. They play some games. They have a race. They hear about <laughs> the guy over all these. We have we have red drink today. We we go back and forth. Um, so they find, we passed along the coastline of Epirus to Port Caonia, where we put in below Buthrotum on the height. And here, an unbelievable story reached our ears, that Helenus, the son of Priam, now ruled over cities of the Greeks as heir to Pyrrhus's wife and power. Andromache had found again a husband of her nation. It made me stare, and in my heart I burned with measureless desire to speak to him, to learn of that strange turn of life. So upward inland I went, leaving the port and ships, and as it happened, at that hour she, Andromache, in a grove outside the city, beside a brook, thin replica of Simois, was making from a ceremonial meal her offerings and libations to the dust, calling the great shade at a tomb called Hector's, made by her, an empty mound of turf where she had blessed twin altars for her tears. But when she saw me coming and saw the men around me in Trojan arms, her mind misgave, and gazing at this ghostliness and terror, she stood there pale and rigid, till the warmth ebbed from her and she swooned, and it was long before she spoke, or barely spoke, your face, can it be real? Are you real, messenger, coming before me, goddess-born, alive? Or if sweet daylight left your eyes forever, where, where is my Hector? Then she wept and filled the grove with wailing. I had difficulty forcing a few words out amid her passion, so overcome I felt, but murmured to her, Alive, oh yes, though every mortal danger this world holds, I carry on my life. Be sure that what you see is real. Ah, tell me, since you were so bereft of such a husband, what change has come to your relief? What fortune worthy of the wife of Hector, Andromache, than Pyrrhus's wife and slave? So on this random island they come across, there are Trojan people. And they find Andromache, Hector's wife, is here. Poor, poor Andromache. She bent her head with eyes downcast and whispered, Happiest of all was Priam's daughter, the virgin picked to die at the great tomb, below Troy wall of our dead enemy. She never had to bear the slave's allotment, never laid hands on a lord and master's bed. But when our native city burned, we others were shipped out through far seas. 
I bore the pride and insolence of Achilles' warrior son, being brought to bed in slavery of his child. He turned then to a bride in, Leon in Lacedaemon, that's Sparta, Leto's daughter, Hermione. He made me over to Helen, to Helenus, excuse me, to another slave, but now Pyrrhus is dead. Orestes, hot with lust for her, whom he thought stolen from him, and maddened by the furies for spilt blood, caught Pyrrhus unprepared and cut him down before his father's altar. So that's a brief segment. Uh, so if you were watching on Saturday, we heard about Agamemnon coming home from the Trojan War, encountering his awful, unfaithful wife, Clytemnestra, who in part lets him know that their son, Orestes, has been sent off to live uh, with friends, essentially. Now again, there are further stories of all of these children of uh, these characters. So here we find out that Achilles' son, who we know from later stories, had to come to Troy in order for the Greeks to win at the end of the war. That he ends up taking Andromache, Hector's wife, home as his slave, his uh, bound slave woman. They go home to Sparta. And there... Pyrrhus, Neoptolemus, there are different names for him, finds a daughter of Sparta, Hermione. Falls in love with her, sort of passes Andromache off to somebody else. But then Orestes, son of Agamemnon, comes and kills the son of Achilles. So again, we have all of these crazy, crazy convoluted stories of all these bloodlines uh, doing bad bad things <laughs> and we'll we'll talk about that more going forward but uh it's it is interesting and as we saw on saturday cassandra and we hear hear a little bit but we'll see this character again hermione these are names of characters who in the original stories were pitiable awful Terrible things happen to them. You would never want to name somebody after these characters. But more recently, we've gotten some some new versions, some new characters with these names that have been a little bit more, a little bit more inspiring. Depending on how you view the the source material now. So then Andromache ends up with Hellenus. And then they came to this uh, this island, and basically on this island they've built a miniature Troy, and built a Pergamum, a citadel called Ilium's on this ridge. As to yourself, what winds of destiny gave you this voyage? Which of the gods impelled you, all unknowing, here to our coast? What of your child Ascanius, alive still, nourished still by the world's air? Even at Troy, one thought. <gasps> But does the boy remember her, the mother who was lost? And do his father and his uncle Hector stir him to old-time valor and manliness? So she poured out her questions, all in tears, her long and vain lament, when the great soldier and son of Priam, Helenus, approached from the town side with many in his train. Uh, let's skip ahead. Walking along with him, I saw before me Troy in miniature. A slender copy of our massive tower, a dry bro brooklet named Xanthus, and I pressed my body against a Skian gate. Those with me feasted their eyes on this, our kinsman's town. In spacious colonnades, the king received them. And then they have a little, uh, they pour out a little sacrifice. Trojan, interpreter of the gods' will, you know the mind of Phoebus. Know his tripod, know the apolline laurel, know the stars, the tongues of birds, and all the signs of bird flight. Prophecy for me! Uh, so again, Apollo, god of prophecy, so most, most oracles are devoted to him. Not all of them, Not all of them but most of them. Uh, Apollo is also known as Phoebus, Phoebus being the shining one. Uh, 
and they they talk about we need a prophecy so look to the tongues of birds and the signs of bird flight which if you remember from a few weeks ago uh we talked about how augury the foretelling of things uh is based on the movements and the actions of birds All the divine speech from the shrines agreed, I must find Italy, must pioneer in those far lands. The harpy called Kaleno riddled the only strange and evil sign of pallid famine and the wrath of heaven. What dangers must I steer away from first? How set my course to conquer that distress? Hellenus cut down bullocks at his altar with ceremony, begged the gods for peace unbound the sacred ribbons from his head and took me by the hand, leading me in a tingle at the overshadowing power. O Phoebus, in, my, in thy shrine! Then with oracular voice, the priest addressed me. Born of the goddess, highest auspices are clearly to be seen for your seafaring. The Lord God deals out destiny so and turns the wheel of change, so turns the world. A few things out of many shall I tell you, so you may cross the welcoming seas more safely to find harbor in Ausonia. Other details of time to come the Parkai keep from Hellenus, and Saturn's daughter Juno will not allow him speech of these. So even this, a great prophet connected to Apollo, he can't tell you everything that's going to happen. Just a couple things here and there. Just some tantalizing clues that italy you think so near with ports you think to enter ignorant as you are lies far past far lands by untraveled ways you are to make the oar bend off trinacria to pass ausonian water lakes of the underworld the island home of circe the uh, the aeon before your walls can rise in a safe country here are signs for you to keep in mind when in anxiety by a stream apart, beneath shore oaks you find a giant sow, Snow White reclining there, suckling a litter of thirty Snow White young, that place will be your haven after toil, sight of your town. And have no fear of table-biting times. The fates will find a way for you. Apollo will be at hand when called. But now avoid the shoreline to the west, a part of Italy lapped by the tide of our own sea. The towns are all inhabited by evil Greeks. Here the Locrians founded a colony, and Lictian Idomeneus with soldiers took the Salentine plain. Here is that town of Philoctetes, captain of Meliboea, little Patelia, buttressed by her wall. Another thing, when you have crossed and moored your ships ashore, there to put up your altars for offerings, veil your head in a red robe against intrusions on your holy fires. Omen, unsettling sights amid your prayers. So basically, here's a little taste of things to come. Go here, go there, do this, don't do that. Talk to these people, don't talk to those people. It gives them some additional uh, directions. Let's see, at a specific place... Uh, steer for the coast to port, the seas to port, a long sail round away from shores to starboard. These land masses in the past, they say, the one unbroken mainland long ago, in cataclysm leapt apart, a change that the long ages of the past could bring. Uh, the sea rushed in, blah, 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 blah. Now Scylla haunts the starboard side, Charybdis never appeased the side to port, and deep in her whirlwind gulps down the great sea waves, three times a day and spews them up again, sending the whiplash of her spray to heaven. Scylla lies immured in a rocky cave in clefts of inky darkness, darting out her faces, pulling ships onto the reef. First, she looks human. A fair-breasted girl down to the groin, but then, below, a monster, creature of the sea, a wolvish belly merging in dolphins' tails. Now, we talked about this a little bit way back when we were looking at the Odyssey, but uh, we've got Scylla and Charybdis. They're twin, well, <laughs> they're monstrous entities that are 
residing in, in the same place. There's a narrow bit of water that goes between them. And Charybdis is essentially, she's a, a whirlpool that sucks things down and spits up water again. And Scylla is this crazy, horrific monster. Uh, she's again another, she was a young lady doomed by the gods because she betrayed her parents and all this other stuff. But um, from the waist up, she looks like a, a normal girl. From the waist down, she is a bundle of wolves, essentially. She has a bunch of wolves growing out of her lower half that are snapping jaws and the whole thing. So uh, a very, very interesting, very interesting creature she is. Uh, Miss Grisilla, welcome. So then Helenus basically tells him how to steer around. Good luck. And... Ashore there, when you reach the town of Kumai, Avernus's murmuring forests, haunted lakes, you'll see a spellbound prophetess who sings in her deep cave of destinies, confiding symbols and words to leaves. Whatever verse she writes, the virgin puts each leaf in order back in the cave. Unshuffled they remain. But when a faint breeze through a door ajar comes in to stir and scatter the light leaves, she never cares to catch them as they flutter on or to restore them or to join the voices. Visitors unenlightened turn away and hate the Sibyl's shrine. <laughs> well, I mean, the Aeneid definitely references past epics, right? I mean, everything. Iliad, Odyssey, we just had some uh, Argonautica. There's a lot of it. So it mentions Kumai and the, the Sibyl, the priestess who's there. So this is another... Ooh, Space Greeks, cool. Uh, so Kumai is in... Italy, and it's again another one of these places where there was a, a prophet in ancient times, a young lady uh, called the Sybil, and she was in a cave, and she would make these pronouncements. They would write them on, like he was just talking about here, uh, write them on leaves, and then they'd have to figure out what they all meant and put them together. And this was another place I was very lucky to uh, to visit. There's not much there now. They're sort of like all right, there's a cave over there, and that's where we're assuming things happen. Uh, yeah, Hudson Eyes are exactly like, yeah, like Duffy. Uh, it, was a, it was a particularly fun day, though, because that time I was in Italy with my dad and my brother, and <laughs> I had, I, this was many, many, many years ago, and I had looked in a book and figured out all these places I want to go, all these place I wanted to visit that were, you know, ancient ruins and things like that. And so I figured out, okay, here's, here's where we're staying in, was it, did we go there from Rome? Anyway, wherever we were staying. And then here's Kumai. Okay. And there are buses that go there. So I tried to figure it out. So we're there. We get our bus tickets there. It's essentially, it's like, um, it's a circular bus route that goes through these little tiny towns in the middle of nowhere. And then it ends up at Kumai and then there's like a beach, and then you got to get on the bus going back around the circle uh, to come back. We don't know any Italian, my father, my, my brother, and I. We get our bus passes, we take the bus, we get to Kumai, we look around, it's, it's cool, it's ancient. My family doesn't care, but I'm all about it, I love it. We get on the bus... It keeps going, and it stops in this really cute little town. The bus stops. A couple people get off, and the bus driver gets off. And we're the, we're the only people on the bus, and we're looking around, and we're like, um, okay. So we get off the bus, and the bus driver has turned off the bus and gotten off. So clearly it's not going anywhere. So we're in this teeny tiny town, and nobody speaks English. We go inside, we're trying to talk to the person at the, the little station. No English. Crap. 
So we go outside, and there's this little old man standing outside. And he sees us, and he sees that we're like we're looking around, we're looking at maps, we're trying to figure stuff out. And he comes over, and he starts talking to us in broken, but but pretty good English. We explain what happens. He says, oh, this, the, essentially the, the bus goes one way, it stops, and then an hour later, it goes back the other way. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, thanks. Uh, and then, so my dad's talking to him, and he says, he says, you know, my dad says, oh, you know, you, you speak really good English. And he says, oh, thank you. Uh, do you want to know how I learned? And, sure. It turns out, during, during World War II, uh, he was a soldier, and he learned English in the brothels. <laughs> It was this whole, and then he just started going off on this whole crazy story of his of his past adventures and learning other languages from prostitutes in various countries. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Uh, and then it turned out, and then from then on, it turned out we had an amazing day because this little town, the part that we could see from when we got off the bus, like there was there was just nothing to it. It was just a couple little streets, but a few streets over. It went down to the beach and there were all these resorts and there were people hanging out and we had like this amazing seafood lunch before we got on the right bus and, and headed back. So again, it uh, it was a bit of a scary moment, but we met a very nice <laughs> Italian man who learned English in brothels uh, and then had a great lunch and made our way back. A slight, slight diversion from the text. Ahatsuleiser, uh, they did do those, um, those Shakespeare versions of the Star Wars movies, the adaptations. I, I haven't read them, but you can if you want. Um, uh, yeah. So anyway, they say go, go to the Sybil in Kumai. Talk to her. She'll tell you even more about where to go. Mexican Robbie, your uncle learned English from horror movies. That's awesome. There's some people with really cool stories like that. About like just Yeah. Random ways they learned languages and things from watching something or interacting with something. Um she gives Yeah. So basically they, they tell Hellenus, the prophet who's speaking now, about future prophets that Aeneas has to go to. Uh they finish up. And they leave. So they set sail and they head on to the next stop. Oh, Mexican Robin, uh, not if it was a recent message, um, but I will I will go on and look today. And I, I'm bad with Discord messages. I I don't get notifications, so I sometimes forget about them. But I I will I will check today. I promise. Uh, so they head on, they're sailing, they're sailing, they're sailing. They do some more prayers. They make some more offerings. Aeneas is very good. Hold on. Uh, Mexican Robin, I'll, I'll, I'll check afterwards and I'll, I'll we'll get back to you. Uh, Aeneas is very good everywhere he goes. He prays to the gods. He performs sacrifices. He is very, very pious. Okay. Soon, then, we saw Tarentum's Gulf, or Hercules, if the old tale be true. There, dead ahead, rose the Licinian goddess on her height, then Caulon's towers and Scylaeum, the coast of shipwreck. On the distant sky, Trinacri and Etna could be seen, and soon we heard big seas groaning on beaten rocks and voices of the breakers. Shoals leapt up before our eyes with sands in the sea swell, at which my father Anchises cried, No doubt of it! Here is Charybdis, that abyss! And those perilous points of rock that Hellenus foretold with deadly ledges under sea. Sheer off, men! Put your backs into the stroke! They bent hard to the rowing as commanded, and Palinurus in the leading ship swung his creaking prow over to port. The whole flotilla followed him in turn with oars and wind. On every rolling sea we rose to heaven... 
and in the abysmal trough sunk down into the world of shades. Three times the rock cliffs between caverns boomed. Three times we saw the waves shook and the flung spume drenching the very stars. The wind at last and sun went down together, leaving us spent and in the dark as to our course, we glided quietly on to the Cyclops' shore. So this crazy storm, they're being flung up toward heaven with every swell, and swept down almost to the bottom of the sea in every uh, trough, but they make it through. Here was a mighty harbor, in itself landlocked and calm, out of the wind's way, but Etna just beyond rumbled and flashed, formidable interruption. Up the sky she sent a somber cloud of billowing smoke, a pitch-black turbine full of glowing ash, and balls of fire to lick the stars. Below she vomited rocks and brought up lava streams, entrails of Etna, boiling in the deep. The tale goes that the body of Enceladus, half consumed by thunderbolt, lies prone under that weight, prodigious Etna piled above him, jetting flame from broken furnaces. And when the worn-out giant turns, all Sicily rumbles and quakes and weaves a pall of smoke against the sky. Uh, so again, we've talked a lot of times about how ancient mythology, uh, ancient religions, a big part of it was explaining what the hell things are in the natural world. Where things came from, why are things happening, why is there a mountain and fire is coming out of it and it shakes the ground, what the hell is this all about? Oh, well, that's because there was a giant who pissed off the gods, he was punished, he's underneath, he's thrashing. That's what a volcano is. Uh, they, they land. Then suddenly, out of the forest, at the last extremity of hunger, came the strange shape of a man, in pitiful condition, his arms wide to beg for mercy. We took in the sight, his filth, his uncut beard, his ragged shirt pinned up by thorns. But even so, a Greek, and one sent on an earlier day to Troy with Greek equipment. Seen at a distance, Dardan clothing, Trojan arms, he cringed and stopped a while in fear of what he saw, then stumbled onward to the shore headlong with tears and prayers. In heaven's name, he said, by all the powers I beg you, oh, by the light and air we breathe, take me with you, Trojans. Anywhere at all will be good enough for me. I am, I know it, one of the Danaeans, one from the fleet. I won't deny I fought to take Troy's gods. For that, if so much harm came out of our devilry, cut me to bits, scatter me on the water, drop me in the sea. If I must die, death at the hands of men will be a favor. <laughs> yeah, Mondo, right? Blame, blame it on that one guy. So there's a Greek soldier here. He sees the Trojans. He's afraid. But he says, please, take me with you. Or just kill me, because at least I'll be killed by humans. We told him to speak out. Say who he was. Born of what blood. What fortune put him in such a panic? In the end, he put aside his fear and said, I am an Ithacan of Ulysses' company. Remember Ulysses, Roman for Odysseus. That man beset by troubles. Achaemenides, I'm called. My father, Adamastus, lived in poverty, so I shipped out for Troy. Would God our life of poverty had lasted. My shipmates left me here. They all forgot me. Scrambling to get away from the cave mouth and frightfulness in the cavern of the Cyclops. That is a blood-soaked hall of brutal feasts, all gloom inside and huge. The giant rears his head against the stars. Oh heaven, spare earth a scourge like this, unbearable to see, unreachable by anything you say. And he keeps going. The innards and the dark blood of poor fellows are what he feeds on. I myself looked on when he scooped up two crewmen in his hand, mid-cave, and as he lay back, smashed them down against the rock face, making the whole floor swim 
with spattered blood. I saw him crunch those dead men, running blood and excrement, the warm flesh still a quiver in his teeth. Not that he did not suffer for that act. Not that Ulysses put up with that outrage or lost his self-possession in the pinch. Gorged with feasting and dead drunk with wine, the giant put down his lolling head, lay down enormous on the cave floor. In his sleep, he dribbled bile and bits of flesh mixed up with blood and wine. We prayed to the great gods, drew lots for duties, and surrounded him. Then with a pointed beam, bored his great eye, his single eye under his shaggy brow, big as a Greek shield or the lamp of Phoebus. So we got back at him, some cause for pride, avenging our friend's shades. So if you remember in the Odyssey, Odysseus meets a Cyclops. Not the only Cyclops, one of many, Polyphemus. Goes inside. Well, actually, so if we remember the full story, Odysseus lands on an island sees flocks, goes into a cave, finds wine, finds cheese. They, he and his men start to eat and take these things. And his men say, his men say, okay, cool. We got our food. Let's get out of here. And Odysseus says, nope. I want to stay. I want to wait. Find out who lives here. This must be a civilized fellow. Uh, maybe he'll honor me, famous as I am. And of course, it's the Cyclops. The Cyclops closes the door, traps them in, kills some of Odysseus's men, eats them. Eventually, they blind him, they hide under the sheep to get out, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah. And then, as they're swimming away, or sailing away, rather, uh, Odysseus had said that, you know, his name was Nobody, and Polyphemus comes out and says, Help! Help! Nobody has blinded me! But then, as they're sailing away, Odysseus has to gives into his pride and says, oh, by the way, it was Odysseus, ha ha! And then Polyphemus curses him, and then, uh, you know, all of the other things happen. So here we get, so not only was Odysseus such a dirtbag and did all of that stuff, but he left one of his men behind, and Trojans have to rescue him. Yeah, Max is just, he's, he's loving this. So the dude's still speaking. As for yourselves, put out to sea. Put out to sea, poor fellows. Tall and dangerous as Polyphemus, penning and milking sheep in his rock cave, there are a hundred more unspeakable huge cyclopes everywhere at large along these bays and mountainsides. And now, three times, the long-horned moon has filled with a new glow since I've dragged out my days in woods among the wild things lonely dens and from a peak spied on the cyclops there my heart a tremble at their great footfalls their shouts um, i've eaten berries blah 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 i've been watching for ships whatever ships they might be better you take this life by any form of death you choose he had no sooner spoken than we all saw high on the mountainside the shepherd polyphemus's giant mass in motion with his flocks, advancing shoreward. Vast, mind-sickening, lumpish, heaven's light blacked out for him. He held a pine tree staff to feel his way with, and the woolly sheep were all his company and all the ease of comfort that he had. On reaching the seashore and the deep water, he washed the fluid from his gouged eye pit and gnashed his teeth and groaned, then waded out to the middle depth where still the swell came short of dampening his haunches. So you gotta feel a little sorry for Polyphemus here. He's huge, he's gross, he's scary, but he's wandering around, he's made a, a stick out of a pine tree so he can feel his way around, he goes down to the water. He has to wash out the horrible fluids that are leaking from his eye hole. It's pretty gross. He's, he's not doing so well. Um, 
and he as soon as people get together and they try to leave as quickly as possible. He heard the splash and turned back toward it, but he never got the range of us to reach it, could not breast the full Ionian Sea waiting behind. At this he sent up an unearthly roar at which the waves on the deep sea were shaken. Italy was affrighted far, far inland, and Etna's caverns rumbled. Out of the forest, out of the mountains poured the Cyclops tribe to crowd the bay and shoreline. We could see them standing there, each with his awful eye in impotent rage, the brotherhood of Etna, towering heavenward, terrifying peers, erect with heads as high as oaks in air or evergreen cypresses, great trees of Jove or those in sacred parklands of Diana. So they flee. Unlike Odysseus, Aeneas hears about these these Cyclopes, the Cyclops, and he just says, okay, we're getting the fuck out of here. Gets on the ship, and they go. They don't say anything. He doesn't do any boasting. He doesn't stay to uh, to find out anything more. Nope, we're getting we're getting out of here. Getting getting while the getting's good. Uh, the gnashing of teeth. That's a good question. Yeah, that's something we definitely hear in a lot of uh, ancient works and cultures. I don't know why that's specifically a thing. Maybe just the ancient equivalent of like gritting your teeth. Just a, a common... Like clenching your jaw, gritting your teeth. Yeah, I don't know specifically. Hmm. Good question though. Uh, so they head out. They head northward. The guy they picked up helps them point out some things along the way, so that's always nice. Uh, there's an island lying this side of a Sicilian bay, facing Plamerium Point, where the waves beat. Early people called this island Ortigia. The tale runs that the Aelian stream Alpheus took hidden channels there under the sea, and through your fountain, Arethusa, now infuses the salt waves. There, as directed, we worshipped the pure powers of the place, then sailed on past Haloris's rich plowlands and ponds. Uh, do to do, they go through a, a bunch of little places. A bunch of cool names. And in the end, the port of Drapanum took me in, a landing without joy. For after storms at sea had buffeted me, so often here, alas, I lost my father. Solace in all affliction and mischance. O oh, best of fathers in my weariness, though you had been delivered from so many perils in vain, alas, here you forsook me. Never had Helenus the seer, who warned of many things to make me quail, foretold this grief to me, nor had the vile Caleno. Here was my final sorrow, here the goal of all my seafaring, when after this I put to sea, God drove me to your shores. So with that, Aeneas finishes his recap to Dido. So in this tale before the attentive crowd, Aeneas' single voice recalled the fates decreed by heaven and his wanderings. He fell silent at last and made an end. So in that last place he stops, Drapanum, his father dies. Again, we talk about prophecy. It's rare, exceedingly rare in the ancient world that, number one, you get true and accurate prophecy. And even if you do, it's even more rare that it's actually going to give you the whole story. So Aeneas here says, I got prophecy from the Harpy. I got prophecy from Hellenus. And I never got this information. But now we're back in Carthage to book four, The Passion 
of the Queen. Everybody, everybody ready for a little passion? Now, and remember, Dido, she's, she's cool. She's got people coming to her kingdom. She's open to listening to them, hearing what they're all about. But even so, Venus has sent her young son to ensnare her with love for Aeneas and for his son. The queen, for her part, all that evening ached with longing that her heart's blood fed, a wound of inward fire eating her away. The manhood of the man, the pride of birth, came home to her time uh, came home to her time and again. His looks, his words remained with her to haunt her mind, and desire for him gave her no rest. When dawn swept away with Phoebus's torch and burned away night gloom and damp, this queen, far gone and ill, confided to the sister of her heart. My sister Anna, quandaries and dreams have come to frighten me. Such dreams. Think what a stranger yesterday found lodging in our house. How princely, how courageous, what a soldier. I can believe him in the line of gods, and this is no delusion. Telltale fear betrays inferior souls. What scenes of war fought to the bitter end he pictured for us? What buffetings awaited him at sea? Had I not set my face against remarriage after my first love died and failed me, left me barren and bereaved, and sick to death at the mere thought of torch and bridal bed, I could perhaps give way in this one case to frailty. I shall say it. Since that time, Sichaeus, my poor husband, met his fate, and blood my brother shed stained our hearth gods, this man alone has wrought upon me so and moved my soul to yield. I recognize the signs of the old flame, of old desire. But, O oh, chaste life, before I break your laws, I pray that earth may open, gape for me down to its depth, or the omnipotent with one stroke blast me to the shades, pale shades of Erebus in the deep world of night. That man who took me to himself in youth has taken all my love. May that man keep it, hold it forever with him in the tomb. Poor Dido. Poor, poor Dido. Even now, as impressed as she is by Aeneas, as afflicted as she is by this curse of love, she still remembers her vows and the things that she's learned and the things that she said that after her husband was murdered by her brother she would never love again all of her love went down with him into the underworld so there is a push and pull going on here even still at this she wept and wet her breast with tears but Anna her sister answered dearer to your sister than daylight is. Will you wear out your life, young as you are, in solitary mourning, never to know sweet children, or the crown of joy that Venus brings? Do you believe this matters to the dust, to ghosts in tombs? Granted, no suitors up to now have moved you, neither in Libya nor before in Tyre. Iarbis you rejected, and the others, chieftains bred by the land of Africa, their triumphs have enriched, Will you contend even against a welcome love? Have you considered in whose lands you settled here? On one frontier, the Gaetulians, their cities, people invincible in war, with wild Numidian horsemen, and the offshore banks, the Syrtes on the other, desert sands, bone dry, where fierce Barcaean nomads range. Or need I speak of future wars brought on from Tyre and the menace of your brother? Surely, by dispensation of the gods, and backed by Juno's will, the ships from Ilium held their course this way on the wind. Sister, what a great city you'll see rising here, and what a kingdom from this royal match, with Trojan, Trojan soldiers as companions in arms, by what exploits will Punic glory grow? Only ask the indulgences of the gods, win them with offerings, Give your guests ease and contrite of reasons for delay while winter gales rage 
drenched Orion storms at sea, and their ships, damaged still, face iron skies. So the sister, Anna, says, well, wait a minute. What would be so bad about this? Now, Anna has not been directly influenced by the gods. She's just, she's innocent in this. But she says, look, you've, you've sworn off men. You've fended off suitors before. Mainly because they were people from, uh, you know, neighboring and rival kingdoms that we were afraid of. But this dude seems cool. He seems like a good guy. Maybe he and his people would make good allies and we can build here together with them. Let's make some excuses why they can't leave so quickly. Oh, the, the weather's going to be bad. We got to rebuild your ships, all this other kind of stuff. Let him stay. Let's, let's see what happens. Poor Anna. Poor Dido. It's not going to end well. This council fanned the flame already kindled, giving her, sis or he blah, giving her hesitant sister hope and set her free of scruple. Visiting the shrines, they begged for grace at every altar first, then put choice rams and ewes to ritual death for Ceres, giver of laws, Father Lycaeus, Phoebus, and for Juno most of all, who has the bonds of marriage in her keeping. Dido herself, splendidly beautiful, holding a shallow cup, tips out the wine on a white shining heifer between the horns or gravely in the shadow of the gods approaches opulent altars. Through the day she brings new gifts and when the breasts are opened, pours over organs living still for signs. Alas, what darkened minds have soothsayers? What good are shrines and vows to maddened lovers? The inward fire eats the soft marrow away, and the internal wound bleeds on in silence. As you remember, when we talked a few weeks ago about ancient prophecies and uh, different ways of telling the future from looking at random things, here we've got Dido performing sacrifices. Uh, She's a, she's a heruspex here. She's reading the organs of animals that she's sacrificed, pouring through their organs, looking, to, looking for signs. Uh, oh, is that liver blemished? Does that mean something? How many lobes does it have? And we get this line. What darkened minds have soothsayers? And as we heard when I was reading from that textbook, uh, even ancient people kind of thought that this kind of <clears throat> fortune telling was bullshit. <laughs> They're like, mm, can you really believe all this kind of stuff? Nah, that's kind of bullshit. Uh, okay, let me just, I'll finish this next page. Unlucky Dido, burning in her madness, roamed through the city like a doe, hit by an arrow shot from far away, by a shepherd hunting in the Cretan woods, hit by surprise. Nor could the hunter see his flying steel had fixed itself in her. But though she runs for her life through copse and glade, the fatal shaft clings to her side. Now Dido took Aeneas with her among her buildings, showed her Sidonian wealth, her walls prepared, and tried to speak, but in mid-speech grew still. When the day waned, she wanted to repeat the banquet as before, to hear once more in her wild need the throes of Ilium, and once more hung on the narrator's words. Afterward, when all the guests were gone, and the dim moon in turn had quenched her light, and setting stars weighed weariness to sleep, alone, she mourned in the great empty hall and pressed her body to the couch he left. She heard him still, though absent, heard and saw him. Or she would hold Ascanius in her lap, enthralled by him, the image of his father, as though by this ruse to appease a love beyond all telling. Towers, half-built, rose no further, 
Men, no longer trained in arms or toiled to make harbors and battlements impregnable. Projects. Projects were broken off, laid over, and the menacing huge walls with cranes unmoving stood against the sky. Now that last bit there is important. How do we first... When Aeneas first arrived and sees Carthage, how is it described? Do you remember? The Carthaginians, they're like bees. They're so hardworking. They're focused on their tasks. Everybody's working, building, guarding, training, practicing. And again, to a Roman, that's, uh, that's like porn. <laughs> Very exciting. But now what's happened? The queen has fallen in love. She's neglecting her duties. And because of that, from the very top, the rot has filtered down. And even the common people, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. The walls are unmanned. Building projects have stopped. Ooh. Painful to a Roman. No, say it ain't so. They stopped work? Yeah. So that's what that means. <laughs> And again, that uh, that distinction between how we first we first saw. Yep, like a rotting fish, right from the head. So next time we'll catch up and continue on with Dido, her love, her passion, her anguish, and what happens to her. Excuse me. <clears throat> Like I said, did not get much sleep last night. Let's see if anybody is online who we should raid. So hopefully you are all off to a good start to your week. Uh, it is Monday. That can be challenging for some people. Uh, hang in there. <laughs> I think that's all I can say. I believe this week will be all normal streaming. Should be. I don't see anything odd happening. Yep, according to Twitch, I still have 377 followers. When a few hours ago, I had over a thousand. Wild. Wild, I tell you. It's fine. This is fine. Um, yeah, Aridin. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I'm almost done with book two, by the way. Uh, in fact, the other night, I, w I meant to tell you, uh, I had a dream that I was hanging out with Amos. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's that's weird. Uh, Rabbit Wombat, yes, Wednesday your vaccination, awesome. Good luck. Hopefully, you do not suffer any side effects. I didn't have any from my first Moderna shot. Just soreness but that's what everybody gets uh maybe tomorrow yeah i mean like i said it's follower count on twitch once you hit once you hit affiliate follower count doesn't matter so um oh you had side effects yeah i mean again some it's it is seemingly random who is going to get them and who will not peg dunk next monday get num shot number two awesome yeah, I get my second shot next Friday. Yeah, my wife is this Friday. I'm next Friday. Let's all let's all get it done. Yes, yes, yes. Um, hmm. What else? What else? I think that's it. I'll have everything from Saturday will be on YouTube. Probably soon. I'll probably get the the Agamemnon stream up in the next day or so, so people can can share it. Um, yeah, should we get? Uh, Aaron and will probably be a while. Yeah, I know. People, there are definitely some people still in areas where uh, it's not widely available just yet, but hopefully soon. Here it was. 
it was very sudden. Like it, it wasn't going to be widely available. Then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, go. Everybody can make their appointments now. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> they, your province just set a new record for number of new cases. Uh, yeah, there are there are still uh, still a lot of cases out there. Still a lot of a lot of bad stuff. So, hopefully, you all can get your vaccinations soon, if you haven't already. All right, everyone. Uh, don't be like Odysseus and be a bad captain. Be a good person like Aeneas. <laughs> and uh, have a great rest of your day. Hopefully I'll see you back here tomorrow. We'll play with toys. <clears throat> and uh, let's go see what our good friend Tiny Chris is doing. Bondo, second one in about two weeks. Cool, just like me. Awesome. Or I guess a little bit after me. Yes, let's all get the vaccines. And then we'll all hang out. You me we're gonna do it all right uh go say hi to tiny chris have a great day oh hold on i pressed the first button give it a second six five four three two one okay bye <laughs>